Hello, everyone, and welcome to our conversation on an integrative approach to treating persistent pain within the symptomatic hypermobility population. My name is Patty Stott. I will be talking in the first half of our presentation. Um, and I am in the Colorado area and also via telehealth. I work with patients with symptomatic hypermobility with rehabilitative strategies um, in functional medicine and health and wellness. And uh, for the second half, Dr. Linda Bluestein will be taking over, who's also in the Colorado area and through telehealth, who specializes in integrative pain management with our population as well. So just to touch on what an integrative approach is, we're not going to elaborate on everything that we might be able to do for these patients, but what we wanted to do is address some of the layers. Um, so again, we'll, we'll kind of run through what the layers might look like but the individualized treatment is really based on this conversation that happens about the past and current history that's going on with the patient, whether it's um, medical or personal or emotional or social. We get a real idea of what they have experienced and what might be feeding into their pain experience that they're having. Um, so it's where conventional meets complementary. We really have this building of a relationship um, to figure out the layers in an individual. And we're not going to go through this whole definition of pain. I really have this here to explain that pain's complicated. Pain is very layered. And this is the new definition that was revised for the International Association for the Study of Pain. Uh, pain is an adverse of sensory and emotional experience typically caused by or resembling that caused by actual or potential injury. So this is really subjective. The important thing to understand is that subjective experiences are valid. They're actually uh, a biological response in the body. And we have to remember that we have these layers that are feeding into the experience of pain. So especially when we have chronic pain or um, amplified pain or pain disorders, we have to remember these layers that are contributing to their valid subjective experience that they're having. There are different types of pain. There are some that we consider typical and then some that we consider atypical. And we certainly want to make sure that we're addressing the atypical patterns uh, because that can lead to chronic issues for an individual. But nociceptive and neuropathic pain, we would expect these after an injury to the orthopedic system or the neurological system. And as those tissues heal, we have resolution of the pain that's present. However, nociplastic pain, that's our atypical response that we can have and that's going to come from potentially pain, uh, changes in the pain system itself. The pain is real, but what happens is there's a communication issue during the translation of and the perception of what's happening in the body. And this typically happens with an underlying disease or condition. So those layered presentations that we see with this population might make it more, uh, more common for us to find atypical pain patterns. With an integrative approach, we not only look at that localized pain um, where it's happening in each area of the body, but we look at how those areas interplay with the other things that they're experiencing in different areas of the body, um, different systems, but then we also look at the patient as a whole. So we really get a good idea of are we treating one thing, seven things, or what, what would be the most impactful for the individual? And this could actually sh change and shift as they begin to progress through their healing cycle. This comes from an article that was just out this year that Dr. Linda Bluestein um, had participated in. This is an acronym that is meant to help sort out some of these layers. And we are going to go through these layers. We're not going to go through the specifics of each one because, as we noted, the integrative approach is really individualized. So what we'd like to do is just explain a little bit about each one of these um, these topics that we have, these are great ones to go through with the patient and then to revisit over and over because what we are addressing primarily might change as they start to heal in one area and improve in one area and need more help in another. So this strategy, the men's PEMS, I'll be going over the M-E-N-S and then Dr. Linda Bluestein will be taking over for the P-M-M-S section. This movement piece is really important, especially for this population. So the M stands for movement. And we really want to make sure that we're encouraging movement, but we also have to figure out a healthy relationship with movement for these patients who a lot of times have adapted with abnormal movement strategies because of pain or fear avoidance because of the pain that they feel with movement. So we really have to recognize that there is this dynamic relationship that happens with the nervous system, the movement ad adaptations because of pain, and that can affect recovery as well. So we have to remember that when we're talking about movement, we're not just talking about workout plans. We're talking about how can we make this therapeutic for the individual, whether it's a single motion um, or it's a, 
a program that we're developing for them. We have to figure out what's the therapeutic movement for the individual that's going to make them um, enjoy movement and return to pain-free mobility. We have to know what makes them feel better. So here's the conversation piece. We have to have a conversation. What makes you feel better? Um, what would you like to get to? What are your goals? Does the individual need support or some sort of bracing to be able to carry out less painful movement or ambulation? Um, what do they enjoy doing? We wanna make sure that the individual is enjoying what they're doing or the goal is towards something that they enjoy doing and they have the motivation to get there. And then we have to know how they're currently presenting. Here's the conversation and the relationship again. Uh, we have a lot of protocols out there, but it really comes down to the individual and what they can tolerate. So it comes down to intention and precision when we're talking about movement. So is this individual starting with just five minutes of intentional breathing exercises that's going to help with core stability, or are they already doing a 30 minute Pilates class uh, and we just need to make some modifications? So we really wanna understand this therapeutic movement part of it in their current state what would be therapeutic to bring them out of this pain cycle that they're having. Education is key, the E in our acronym. Um, education, we talk about pain neuroscience education, and this really comes to explain to the individual the neurophysiological endocrine immune system changes that are happening. Why is their body responding this way with the central nervous system causing these chronic pain reactions? So we try to empower the individual in understanding so that they really know what's going on in their body. We know that with patients that have chronic pain reactions or abnormal or atypical pain responses, that when they participate in pain neuroscience education, they are showing more favorable outcomes, positive changes in pain beliefs, and also uh, improved pain coping strategies with the uh, improving health status. So we're seeing improvements. Um, important in this population too, we see improvements in kinesiophobia and pain catastrophizing, um, and then a big takeaway is to understand that it's never one thing, and that's why we talk about these layers. We really have to explore what's going on as a whole. For pain neuroscience education is more likely effective if it's used as a paving strategy or a stepping stone for the additional appropriate therapeutic intervention. So if we lay this as a foundation, what can we then progress with that therapeutic movement or other things um, that could help improve the patient's situation? Nutrition, this is a very, very long topic in itself. So I really just want to express that nutrition is individual for so many different reasons. There's so many beautiful layers to go through, and that's why we really want these individuals working with um, a medical professional that specializes in this. We know that there's a bi-directional relationship between the central nervous system and the gut microbiome. So this can either uh, help or harm an individual, depending on what they're putting into their system and what's developed within the gut. So we wanna make sure that we are addressing nutri nutrition to work on this pain and inflammatory uh, control for the individual. Uh, the individual is going to need what they need depending on their situation. And this is where it gets complicated. We can't just throw one diet at them because we heard that it works well for everybody with the condition. There's so many layers that go into nutrition. We do know that if we're talking about pain control, there are certain types of diets out there and the research is very limited currently on pain and nutrition. Um, but when we're looking at musculoskeletal pain, vegan diets, caloric reduction, vegetarian diets, low FODMAP and peptide diets might help with musculoskeletal pain. And then low carbohydrate, carbohydrate and keto diets might help with neurological pain and inflammation in that sensitization piece. So just to understand that uh, food comes with intention, that we can actually have positive influences, we just have to know what, what our goal is with the individual. There are so many different layers to go through. You know, we can just talk about general nutrition. Are we trying to keep the inflammation low for the, the individual? How are they with their processed foods? Are they staying hydrated? When they are taking in food, what's the nutritional value looking like that, with the foods that they can handle? Um, and when and how are they eating, depending on if they're dealing with dysautonomia um, or any other uh, gastrointestinal functional issues. Then we can look at the individual as well. Um, so not just the general picture, but they're going to be different based on their genetics as to what they can tolerate, food sensitivities. We talked about the type of pain and they might have um, different reactions with different foods. And then we have these other coexisting conditions like MCAS, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, motility changes that all come with their own diet that might be helpful. So what's wonderful is that there are a lot of different approaches. We just have to understand what we're trying to do in the body in order to reduce the inflammatory effects. Talking about sleep, um, sleep is actually something that us in our acronym 
um, it is actually something that can have a lot of impact because we know that chronic pain syndromes are associated with, with when our circadian and biological rhythms actually lose their synchronization. So melatonin itself has analgesic effects. Um, it can really help with pain and inflammation. It's been used with uh, migraines, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, anxiety, postoperative pain. So there's, there's a lot of things that melatonin we know helps with. Um, it's a chemical of darkness. We're not going to get it unless we close our eyes and go to sleep. So we have to make sure that we are working on this sleep component. There's so many different things that it can actually help regulate and affect in the system. So we can't overlook this. But then we have internal and external uh, issues that can happen for the individual. And this is where it can become um, difficult to be able to treat. The external, I would say, are a little bit easier for us to impact ourselves. Is it a poor sleep routine, painful sleeping positions, increased stimulation before bed like blue light? Is there something that we can modify to help there? But this internal issue, if we're waking up or can't get to sleep because of something internal that's happening like autonomic dysregulation, organ involvement or bladder issues, that can be much more difficult to address, but again, still worth it because we need that melatonin and we need that rest and recovery overnight to reduce those, um, those painful inflammatory responses. And I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Linda Bluestein, who will take over and talk about the end of the acronym. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Stott. The next letter in the acronym is P, which stands for psychosocial. In addition to the many biologic or physical factors that influence pain perception and suffering, there are many psychologic ones as well as depicted in this figure. I would like to highlight in particular traumatic experiences, fear, and cognitive beliefs. Traumatic experiences are common in people with chronic pain, and trauma can take many forms. What is traumatic for one person is not necessarily traumatic for another person. People with both chronic pain and PTSD report more PTSD symptoms, pain, disability, anxiety, depression, and opioid use than those with one condition. And this 2023 paper describes a specific form of medical trauma with hypermobile EDS patients, which they refer to as clinician-associated traumatization. In particular, the authors found 80% of interviewees were immediately able to identify at least one particularly stressful encounter with clinicians. They had a perceived lack of empathy, which negatively impacted the relationship, leading to a strong distrust of the medical institution. And even if that person had a strong and trusting relationship with a single clinician, that was not sufficient to repair the effects of institutional betrayal. And this led to worse but preventable outcomes. Beliefs are another important consideration because beliefs can predict chronic pain duration and disability. Beliefs are modifiable, therefore they are an important target for the treatment and prevention of persistent pain. Addressing unhelpful and erroneous beliefs on the part of both the patient and the clinician should be first-line treatment. The transition from acute to chronic musculoskeletal pain can be facilitated by unhelpful pain beliefs. And pain can best be considered a summation of a multitude of intermingled mechanisms with optimal treatment following an integrated biopsychosocial approach. Well, what can we do? We need healthcare reform so that patients are always believed and clinicians are better able to address complex patients like those with EDS and HSD. We need to take steps to reduce adverse childhood experiences and other forms of trauma. And we need to lessen mast cell activation because pain is a neuroimmune condition. We also need to reduce nervous system danger and increase nervous system safety. The next letter in the acronym is M, which stands for modalities. Pain in EDS and HSD is multifactorial, so different modalities will be effective in different people and with different types of pain. I would refer you to Dr. Stott's other presentation to learn more about modalities. The next letter in the acronym, M, stands for medications. There are no FDA-approved treatments for EDS or HSD. Therefore, all medications are off-label. We want to consider pharmacogenomic testing if a person has been responding unusually to different medications as this can yield helpful information. Detailed, details about failed treatments matter. For example, was the titration schedule one that did not go well with the patient? Was it a problem with the dose or was it a problem with excipients? Excipients are the inactive ingredients in medications that for patients with mast cell disorders are not inactive. We also wanna keep an open mind to new trials. 
And patients and clinicians should both be aware of both the placebo effect and the reverse of that, which is the nocebo effect. If there is a trusting and positive relationship between the patient and the physician, that alone has been shown to palliate symptoms. And patients who perceive their clinicians as empathetic have also been demonstrated to have reduced levels of objective measures of inflammation, such as interleukin-8. There are a number of medications that have been studied for non-helpful or non-acute pain. I am not showing this list to overwhelm you, but to inspire hope. There are many different drugs that are in the pipeline and also existing medications which are being repurposed for non-acute pain. There are other medications that are not on the, this list as well. For example, there are other psychedelics like psilocybin that may have promise also. Well, why don't we just prescribe opioids? Although opioids are helpful with short-term intermittent use, they can cause problems, especially in those with EDS and HSD. They activate glial cells, which are crucial for brain development and nervous system homeostasis. They also activate mast cells, both of which contribute to the pathogenesis of chronic pain. Long-term use is problematic due to tolerance, dependence, opioid use disorder, and disruption of the endogenous opioid system, which is our innate pain relieving system. It has been said that exogenous or externally administered opioids are like taking a hammer to the intricate patterns of neural activity regulated by endogenous opioids. Now, Trexone is an opioid antagonist and in low doses can be helpful for persistent pain. At low dose, it has less affinity for the mu opioid receptor and instead binds to the toll-like receptor four. It breaks the glial cell activation cycle and reduces cytokine release, modulating inflammation. There's a recent, recent scoping review that demonstrated improved pain severity, hyperalgesia, physical functioning, quality of life, and sleep in centralized pain conditions, although there was a variable time to benefits. Adverse effects with low-dose naltrexone are rare and usually dissipate with time or slower titration. They can include vivid dreams, diarrhea, headache, Side effects rarely require discontinuation of the medication, especially if we consider excipient issues and change up the formulation. There's an apparent increase in efficacy over time with eventually a large subset of patients seeing some benefit. We do need to discontinue low-dose naltrexone approximately seven days prior to scheduled surgery when opioids will be administered. The body also has an endocannabinoid system. CB2 is expressed on microglia and regulates proliferation and migration of immune cells. Exogenous cannabinoids may reduce nociception or pain input, mechanical allodynia, and anxiety. Allodynia is when something that is normally not painful actually causes pain. We also need to think about CGRP antagonists. Calcitonin gene-related peptide plays a prominent role in central sensitization and is directly involved in hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia is when something that is normally a little bit painful is a lot painful. CGRP plays an important role in inflammatory responses and migraine pain. Currently, these medications are mostly used for migraine. However, the molecule is ubiquitous, so potentially it's useful for other painful conditions. Ketamine is another medication to consider. It produces dissociative anesthesia, but has powerful analgesic, psychomimetic, anti-inflammatory, and antidepressant effects. It blocks the NMDA receptor, which is crucial in neuroplastic changes such as wind-up and central sensitization. Ketamine can also reverse opioid-induced hyperalgesia and does need to be administered bypassing the um, gastrointestinal tract. In the future, hopefully we will have access to prolonged release ketamine tablets, which may be a safer and more efficient option. Relative contraindications include pregnancy, active psychosis, cirrhosis, severe cardiovascular disease, and increased intracranial pressure. The last letter of the acronym S stands for supplements. Supplements have powerful biologic effects, yet are regulated by the FDA as food, not drugs. They can interact with other supplements or medications, therefore careful supervision is needed. And we want to think about the 10% rule. If we use several different things that each have 10% improvement, then eventually we will get to some meaningful results. And we want to use food before nutraceuticals whenever possible. I want to highlight one supplement in particular, and that is magnesium, as it is a co-activator of hundreds of enzymes. 
Magnesium deficiency is difficult to detect, however, is quite common and contributes to many different symptoms, including fatigue, poor sleep, poor memory, muscle spasms, anxiety, constipation, menstrual cramps, and migraine. Neuroinflammation resulting from magnesium deficiency contributes to chronic pain, hypersensitivity, memory, and emotional deficits. Magnesium is antinociceptive and inhibits central sensitization and decreases pre-existing pain hypersensitivity. Magnesium supplementation can improve dysmenorrhea, fibromyalgia, migraine, and constipation. We have some barriers and challenges to this type of approach. One is the lack of FDA approved treatments. We also have cost concerns and access concerns. Suboptimal communication and trust between stakeholders is also problematic as is the lack of clinical training and research. Trial and error can be a very helpful process, but is also time consuming. Also, this data is mostly extrapolated from other conditions and we need data specific to symptomatic joint hypermobility. Overcoming these barriers can require more training for clinicians, such as the EDS ECHO program, and there are a number of other modalities that we should consider as well, and of course, more research is needed. So in summary, the MENS PMMS is an iterative approach. This is just one example of an integrative, multidisciplinary approach to treating chronic pain. The goal is always improving quality of life and physical functioning. This is not an exhaustive list, but rather a sampling of things supported by the literature and or found helpful in clinical practice. And there is reason to have hope. I wanna give a little shout out to several of my patients who I know are in the audience today, and to all of you, patients, caregivers, medical professionals, advocates, and community members. It is an honor to meet you and serve you in this way. I hope our paths continue to cross. And thank you so much to the Ehlers-Danlos Society to, for inviting us to speak today.